that reminds me of like my favorite interactions when like someone see me reading like capital around and like or like at work or like in public people will just be like oh what you read and i'm like oh capital and they're just like oh are you trying to start a business <laughs> like, <laughs> like no <laughs> Hello and welcome to the 127th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Monday, the 27th of July, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today we speak with Dick Hunzinger and Nathan Eisenberg about their recent article, Mask Off, Crisis and Struggle in the Pandemic, and the general decay of US hegemony and the future of capitalism. Dick and Nate are probably best known by their Twitter handles, Dickophrenic and PostCyborg, but today we deal with them as humans. This is the first of a two-parter, the second part of which will be released in a couple of days as a patron-only podcast. Speaking of patrons, this week I have the new patrons to thank, John Treat, Mechanical Man, Kurt, and the return of Grant Jensen. If you'd like to support the show, for only $5 a month you get two Patreon-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote in the next Reading Group series. This week, I've also just done the first fortnightly Patreon-only livestream, which is due to be released for the plebs in a couple of days. I've put the links to the guys' Twitter handles and the article we're discussing in the show notes. Okay, let's go to the interview. Guys, the American system seems to be in such a deep crisis that I, I don't think I've seen in a major Western state since probably 68. Well, we've true? yet to make Trump flee, flee the country like De Gaulle. So yeah. we, we got him in a bunker. We that, did get him in a bunker for a second. Yeah, that, that was pretty cool. <laughs> two and a half times, two and a half times. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in so many ways, and that it's not, I wouldn't say it's strictly American because America isn't strictly America. Like the system in place here is so extensive across the world uh, in terms of managing crisis, and maintaining everything that, you know, global over accumulation in a sense, kind of the contradictions of that concentrates in the United States in the form of like political insanity. I mean, that's like a little reductive, but yeah. I just, there's so many layers to how like fucked up it is here. I, I think about like the, the anti-police uprisings we've seen here and also just the massive hit we've taken uh, with COVID-19 and the uprisings we've had here feel also very much in continuity with the wave of uprisings we saw in like mid to late 2019, which I think is really important. And I like you only see really get like connected in a few ways, but there were like how many countries that were experiencing it was like, over twenty? Yeah, it was like you you had like Haiti, Chile, France still doing its thing, post Yellow Vest stuff, Hong Kong, Iraq, yeah, uh, protest in Iran. You know, banks got burned down there. Lebanon is really big. Yeah. Right? Lebanon is going through like a full on economic crash right now. Like. There was something like like last week or the week before I was reading like there's been a lot of instability there and their currency is basically just collapsing. But there was also some like six billion dollars smuggled out of their banking system a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so like hey, like capital is fleeing Lebanon as well. Where else? Sudan. Did you say Haiti? Yeah, I said Haiti. Sudan. And Sudan started earlier. Yeah. Too. Which the thing with Sudan is like they just partitioned the country. I mean, a while ago, like 2010, maybe, I want to say. And South Sudan is like, I might be mixing them up, but I'm pretty sure South Sudan is kind of in the U.S. sphere of influence, and Sudan is in the Chinese sphere of influence. So in in a way, a lot of these different uprisings that occurred are like reverberations of like the impact of like U.S. imperialism in so many ways. Yeah. And, and like responding to this sort of like intercapitalist competition that's happening in this like really this sort of like culminating point of this like long crisis where now it's a matter of like 
competing national buttresses for like ensuing capital accumulation or you know at least keeping viable what is of capital accumulation today which is like pretty stagnant and subject to these sort of like violent shifts <laughs> yeah like, interesting one with that kind of related to it is like Nathan and I like watched this stuff and uh, there was BlackRock who is directing a lot of central bank asset purchases right now and a lot of like relief efforts during the pandemic. They're like the world's largest private asset manager, like $7 trillion of like capital like uh, managed, but they released their mid-year economic report recently and were under or underwriting or downgrading evaluations for us stocks in favor of like european stock exchanges so there's like all of these shifts happening as like you're starting to see like political actors and capitalists as well try to cohere some sort of like <laughs> global rearrangement that can allow yeah. for like these relations to continue like reproducing <clears throat> and it's just incredibly turbulent nothing is certain it's surprising you mentioned BlackRock after the 2008 crisis. They came into Ireland and bought up all the property on the cheap and basically Airbnb'd the whole lot. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. Like, I mean, billions of, of, of pounds worth. They single handedly caused the rent in Dublin to like double or triple in, in about five years because everybody started basically renting out their gas for Airbnb. And now the Airbnb market has collapsed. With yeah, the, uh, with the COVID crisis, I think rents of rents. I, my Irish friends will tell me I'm wrong, but I think they've like halved in the last few months in the, across the because Damn, literally. Why won't that happen here? <laughs> yeah, I, ours is still lagging a bit because, like, I know my landlord's trying to hike my rent up like fifty percent. Like, rents haven't collapsed here just yet. I think a lot of landlords are still operating on a sense of just trying to recover cash flows, and there hasn't been like the full like collapse of like mortgage-backed securities just yet <laughs> also airbnb contributes greatly but sounds more monocausal in ireland whereas here you know there's like other yeah causes like a, of gentrification like in dublin it's particular you know it's like a, a tourist trend. yeah why do we think the political system in america is so dysfunctional compared to some other like european i think probably more so than other european <laughs> polities you know yeah. <laughs> you don't think so no i do think so think no yeah think yeah polity. very dysfunctional oh yeah i i think there's it, it's hard to beat the us in terms of dysfunction right now like we we really got a handle on that title <laughs> yeah usa usa i mean there's a lot of reasons i think that like the Probably the most significant underlying causal factor is the just total erosion of social reproduction. Like between the New Deal and the Great Society of the 60s here, the state was had a hand, a very strong hand in tying wages and quality of life and like all the buttresses of the middle class, like home ownership, higher education tying that with the essentially the you know the rate of profit in the US the actual like you know a, a huge amount of money that was being made uh, in the post war boom and making sure that those tracked and that was largely because there was like fairly organized kind of you know class warfare peaking in the 30s and then in the 40s transforming into this kind of like clientelist corporatist relationship and that became I think there's just but it you know obviously it's contradictory and then as soon as like the downturn really picked up and the US kind of hit its first this preceded the first big stagflation issue in the 70s because they kind of started attacking welfare in the 60s but with Reagan and shit it was able to like really go into overdrive and it's just been you know I think the parties reorganized to a great extent around a consensus of dismantling all of this like the the third way or whatever with the clinton um the clinton uh the clintons the clinton <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you know basically converged in a obviously branded different than reagan and bush but so whereas in i think a lot of european countries that has been less total is my understanding i mean correct me if i'm wrong and i know that austerity especially after 2008 has really taken like Europe 
But it just seems like here, it's been like three generations already of mm. this decline. And like, what that leads to is, you know, we're like, for example, an extremely housing insecure country. There's 500,000 homeless people in a given night. The majority of renters are one missed paycheck away from missing rent. And we have obviously just very authoritarian politics around property debt obligation. You know, where I think we're like the only country that takes credit scores seriously. Like mm-hmm. we live in a place where if you fuck if you fuck up once, then you are punished for years or maybe even like intergenerationally. Like the yeah. So I think that kind of like social decay creates alongside really intense depoliticization, you know, whether it's the cultural sphere, which is super monopolized. So we just have like multinationals like feeding us like brain rot or in like directly in politics where you just have like, you know, they have like recuperation down to a science and it all works together. You know, Fox News and the Republicans, MSNBC and the Democrats. So you have this intense depoliticization at the same time as there's like this like huge degeneration of people's quality of life. So you're going to have like these insane political factions forming. And like, you know, our country is like in no insignificant way, more or less ruled by like evangelicals, like because whichever political bloc can be like best organized and get out votes and like gerrymander the best, they're the ones that have all the power. So that is, I think, is what sets the U.S. apart from Europe to mm-hmm. a large extent. Yeah. And I, I would also add with that, too, like, I think an important thing there is, like, the way in which that sort of, like, deteriorating infrastructure of social reproduction, how that has been mediated over the past few decades, too, because, like, it's it's that, you know, the importance of credit scores there. You know, it's, like, our ability to come out with sort of, like, the creation of, like, a robust middle class, like, racialized middle class, like, reaction formation in the post-war years as a buffer to the intense like class war of the depression and world war ii eras also meant like that that process of like decomposing a sort of like working class the these sort of gains that working the working class was like made during the new deal eras necessarily started impinging on profitability meant that you know the next step is basically like using that degree of capitalist development to kind of become like a very industrialized consumption sphere with like the kind of like middle class buffer that can basically become like a new sort of like wealthier world market for like realization of surplus value of like productive capacity that has been exported elsewhere. And one of the other ways too, is just like once that starts happening and like you don't have the infrastructures of like social reproduction that you need for like, like a working class to reproduce in the same way, it becomes about like, credit extensions <laughs> so like we like consumer credit has been like incredibly vi- like vital to the u.s economy for decades it's it's kind of like a, a i think brenner calls it this or like other people do but it's like a, a subsidized demand <laughs> like this becomes like central to like you know like how people are able to buy homes how people are able to like purchase goods uh over the last few decades like private like household debt just continues to skyrocket and that's like one of the things that ties this whole economy together. It's also one of the things that like uh, for corporations as well, around the same time, their own private debt started kind of has this little like hockey stick formation in like graphs of the time, like starting in like the late seventies, early eighties, it just starts going (laughs) as production starts getting exported globally. And you can see this reflected in central bank figures and like interest rates after the Volcker shock, which like sought to curb inflation our economy is like very reliant on basically just being able to maintain credit worthiness and extending lines of credit, which means that you need optimal conditions for liquidity, which means like lowering interest rates throughout, which means like keeping cash moving, even if there's no real yeah. traction, that's like actually allowing for like a real like material expansion of value. So you kind of end up with like global over accumulation and like the US is placed in it, you basically got like permanent and systemic deindustrialization the world over, where it's like even like global South countries that, you know, produce a lot of our commodity goods and stuff are experiencing varying degrees of like deindustrialization, like China is, but it's like these high organic composition in productive infrastructures that can move around, but like quantitatively represent like the same sort of like fixed 
ratio of productive apparatus with like an increasingly like growing and swelling circulation sphere where you have like more and more like frontier forms of extraction. And the US is just like kind of like over balanced of like that circulation form of the ladder. So it's just about like constantly pumping this stuff in and hoping that <laughs> we're able to like keep consuming goods. And I think that also is like one of those things that like contributes to like some like, you know, like post or like around Occupy era politics of just like anti-consumer society stuff is yeah. like kind of just like a gut reaction response to the immediacy of how apparent that is. And like kind of how vulgar. Well, I think the, the board helps us too. Cause I think that mm -hmm. the alienation is not just that you go to work and like you alienate your labor, but like, yeah. Oh, my entire life amounts to like buying the next thing. I think yeah. that's like, there's a visceral recognition of that. Mm -hmm. And I think the, with credit, it's important to understand what credit is. And it's essentially, it's from the future, right? It's just, it's shit. That, it's, <laughs> it's accumulation that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. So if we're subsidizing demand now with the promise that we will actually produce value later at the same time that we have this endemic high organic composition, which, you know, is, is a certain organization of the production process where most value is just coming from like machinery and equipment, technical apparatuses. And so the actual expansion of value is as a relative rate declining. So there's only so much blood you can squeeze from a stone, right? And so because we're banking, so to speak, on value expanding to a greater degree than it possibly can, given the global kind of organic composition of capital, then, you know, credit is fictitious until the day of payment, right? You're, it's a promise, and that promise can be broken unless you pay it off. And so we and this is obviously more than the US. I mean, I would say like the city of London is actually like almost more significant to this than Wall Street, but mm -hmm. the whole like financialized regime, you know, is essentially a way of taking that tiny bit of blood we're squeezing from the stone and just fucking like stretching it as far as we can and injecting it wherever we can. And, you know, we talk about credit worthiness. I think a part of that is not just like keeping interest rates low and like whatever, but it's all kinds of risk hedging and you know that's where derivatives and securities come in and that is used in order to like make people credit worthy who their real incomes cannot possibly support that kind of debt and that's where you get the whole subprime mortgage mm -hmm. crisis is like we're subsidizing demand more than is reasonably sustainable given how much on the other end the capitalist class in the US is suppressing necessary labor, you know, suppressing wages. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people are found in this position where their cost of living exceeds how much they make. And they just like fucking make huge sacrifices or they just, again, pull this credit from the future. And for them, that may or may not come, they may or may not get a better job. But in total, you know, there aren't enough better jobs and there, there isn't enough like better investment opportunities to make all this go. So we just end up swapping this debt indefinitely and mm. finding more and more abstruse ways of deferring the day of payment. And periodically the day of payment, you know, it accumulates enough of these debts have to turn over that mm. you get a financial crisis and that sends shockwaves like all across the world. Yeah. And I think that this is something like Europe definitely shares with the U S but like Dick referenced this like racialized kind of class composition of like the middle class. And I think that, you know, in the post-war system, like European colonialism formally came to an end. And what happened was the United States kind of jumped in and took on the mantle of like colonizing in order to rebuild Europe as well as expand its own capital. And in the process, both Europe and the US and then later Japan, kind of Brazil and China you know, are able to develop these like middle classes. And in both Europe and the US, at least, it was the white middle class, you know, it was extremely racialized formation. And you could track that in material terms, just in like, who owns houses and how much household wealth there is in white versus African American families, for example. But obviously, there's like a whole host of like cultural geographic variants, like suburbs, and the kind of like, just insane psychosis that the white 
middle class, whether it's France or the UK or the US, lives under. You know, we were talking about paranoia earlier. Like, this is the most paranoid people on the planet. Well, and they know it's they know it's so tenuous. Exactly, and, and tenuous. It's like it's going away. Like the yeah. only the very lucky. You know, like there's enough deterioration of this. It's like kind yeah. of beset on all sides, and it's obviously far more than cultural values. Yeah. So you know, Europe and the U.S. have been kind of like this right wing shift is basically this kind of old constituency that was like I guess relatively tame. Not exactly, but periodically <laughs> they get incensed yeah. and become like, you know, that one of them shoots their lawnmower or whatever. Like, yeah. like the violence is always there under the surface. Yeah. And what we're seeing in the last decade is like... Or they start um, like Klansmen homeowner associations. Yeah, I mean, exa- this, it's always yeah. been a very <laughs> bloody history. But <laughs> it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's re-emerging as overt politics, I guess is a better way to put it, like... The mm-hmm. 60s was like the last time you could be a segregationist, but now you can be segregationist again. Yeah. And, and another thing to point out with like the, we're talking about the middle class folks a lot too, with like credit worthiness and like subsidizing demand and shit. Like it's the, the other important thing is like, I mean, this is even more so endemically like a problem with like multinational corporations and just like actual like functional, functional quote unquote, like capitals <laughs> in like the global economy. Because, like, uh, oftentimes it's, you have this, like, mention that, that if folks don't know this term, uh, zombie firm is, like, yeah. a real phenomenon in, like, global businesses where they they mostly, like, subsist on, like, being yes. able to service debt. I read a, I read a statistic yeah. and that said that one third of all U.S. firms are zombie firms. Yeah. They need, to t- they need to take out more debt to service their existing debt. Yeah, that's the only uh-huh. way their debts can get paid, and that's even like what a lot of like post two thousand eight stock buyback programs were like effectively doing is yeah. like, and that's like why the Federal Reserve explain that to a stick. What you mean uh, that process? They are purchase their own shares of stock to like maintain viability in like a market. Like you can like pump up your own valuation by controlling yeah. how much of your like like by using because this is like the cent- central banks do this with like maintaining liquidity like we see like the the federal reserve and other central banks are like purchasing assets as well as like also entering into like short-term liquidity operations like repurchase agreements they are using purchase exchange operations you know like the form of mediation par excellence in all of capitalism like they use that to manage money supply supply of liquidity just like controlling prices and stuff like that this is how that gets managed so Stock buybacks, they they literally just like control through like shareholders or otherwise like purchases of their stock and how much supply there is. Cause these people do like legit believe in and operate on like supply demand, like economics. Like, so that's why it's this constant sort of like, you can kind of imagine like people like running back and forth on like different sides of a seesaw to try to like make sure it balances out. Yeah. But like, they can't really ever do that because the, the literal base of it would not allow for such <laughs> um yeah the fulcrum is falling apart exactly so that that's how that functions and like most of these corporations like you've got you can look at rates of gdp growth across decades and see that it has been just like declining precipitously for most like g7 countries as well as like oecd countries so like rates of accumulation of capital globally have been declining for decades which means that, you know, your possible like source of like surplus value in production that is appropriable is con- like precipitously declining. There's more of the share just sort of like perspective requiring realization, like fictitious capital that exists than there is like a material surplus value that can be like acted upon in an expansive way. And it, it mostly just gets like, a, you know, redistributed around through like appropriations mergers and acquisitions and like consolidations of capitals that allow for, you know, like controlled sort of like attenuation or like controlled, like market shares become really important for this. Oh, what's that? I've got a graph (laughs) here for you guys here. Love graphs. Yeah. This is, this one here is just getting to what we're talking about here about managing price. Here is the NASDAQ 100. And so you have the NASDAQ stock prices going up. And then you have the NASDAQ 100 consensus 
12 month forward earnings per share. So basically, uh, this yeah. is like you're expecting kind of profit or something from a, from yeah. a firm. And you see the share price tracks it. And then it hits to, I think, let me see what is the, you see in uh, up until the middle of March, they're tracking kind of perfectly. And in the middle of the March, <laughs> the yeah. Nasdaq goes up to 10,000. And on uh -huh. a similar scale, the earnings per share is down to 6,000. So we see the thing is basically just completely diverged from each other. So like, the CARES Act. Oh yeah. yeah, so it's, yeah. it's very interesting. Like, so this one is shares. Like, so we, we, I've seen you guys talking about CDOs. So they're like kind of subprime yeah. junk bonds, and that thing is going to hit. And the Federal Reserve, I think, has bought. You guys might know the number. What is it? Like a trillion dollars worth of. of uh, oh, honestly, at this point, like I've lost track. I know as of early June, their balance sheet had expanded. Three trillion, I think, from four point two to seven trillion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's and that's the figure we had in that piece. I haven't been able to track it the same way just yet. Mostly because it's like also like watching it, just being like, I'm gonna have to let this sit for a minute and revisit. It's moving so fast. <laughs> I have a few other graphs here. Let me see if I can get another good one. This one is brilliant. This is profits, corporate profits after tax versus the S and P five hundred. Okay. So basically we can see the like the share price is going out of whack compared to profits in the bubbles. And at the moment, like when the crisis hit here in 2020, it was already looked like historically speaking, it was at the peak of a bubble ready to burst. Oh yeah. But, yeah. Well, what has happened is the share prices have stayed fairly static, but corporate profits have absolutely caved. Oh yeah. And you can see this in like, I mean, pretty much any of the, like Nathan and I are like big nerds that like to to read like IMF stuff and like OECD and my personal favorite is the Bank for International Settlements has oh, yeah. great content. They they're 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 really you know they're really frank and honest and uh, very clear stuff. So you know I highly recommend people get into that for some nerd shit. But uh, you know it's it's very well known like corporations right now are like not <laughs> getting any profits. In fact, there was a story. There was a Financial Times thing about um, like there are many companies right now in order to get like their own like lines of credit extended for resuming operations, like which, you know, like they'll do like quarterly and pretty consistently have been using last year's profits at this time for this quarter to like as estimate. like this quarter's profits. Yeah, yeah. To estimate. And like it's just been people are just like, all right, cool. Yeah. Granted, you know, what else are you going to do right now? And it's just like. Woo. It's like the the dumb mastery is normally like not so obvious, so everyone can kind of plausible deniability. But now like they don't have that, so they have to just go forward and we're like, yeah, we're gonna just like openly make stupid decisions and like pretend like it's all okay. Yeah, it's it's so fucking cool. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that uh, 2012 it's pretty much been static, and like it would decline and then go back, and it never exceeded the peak of 2012. So like you know. After um, the bailouts of 2008 and nine, it kind of like recovered a bit, but then it's been totally stagnant for like most of the 20 teens and precipitously declining since 2019. One thing I must say, I know they're buying corporate debt, but yeah. I'm very skeptical of the markets, the share price markets aren't crashing without well, intervention. I'm very, very uh, puzzled by that fact. It's, I mean, I they're, think, they're maintaining activity. It's like a yeah. baseline of activity. Like right now it's just, it's, I think there's just like a lot of cooperation that has to be happening. What Very, do you mean by that? Like, like who's buying these shares to cause them, cause them to go back on the rally back over to where they were before March? Who, like, who, like who's buying those shares? Like, I, I don't, don't know, know a ton <laughs> about the stock market. Like I just like stock markets, mostly just like fun haha -ha when something bad happens and then when it's just like static and everything you just be like all right you know they're just well, doing stuff <laughs> I, I have, a, I have a, a take which is that um we we should distinguish like for our purposes between circulation and production yes and like you know the way marx wrote capital production is like logically prior to circulation and like the production surplus value he talks about how that happens and is possible and how that contributes to like the total reproduction and then only in the third volume does he even get into like the distribution of surplus value, which is actually how the real economy works is because not every capitalist firm, you know, has a factory and like hires workers and 
as a rate of exploitation or whatever. But there's, in fact, like quite a few that subsist off of capturing the surplus value produced elsewhere. And a lot of where that happens is in um, managing prices and the market price actually, you know, can, can redistribute surplus value between different producers because prices actually do doesn't reduce to value. Things often get sold above or below their values because price is sensitive to like supply and demand or whatever. And then on top of that, you know, surplus value isn't, isn't like a real sum. It has to be translated into monetary terms. And so profits, other kinds of revenues, like taxes, interest, and rents all come from the same store of surplus value. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about circulation, you know, we were talking previously about how like production has been deconcentrated from these industrial nations of the so-called first world to these, it's not even that they're deindustrialized and that they're now in third world countries. It's that the actual production process has been globalized. Like there's these global value chains. And mm -hmm. so these are structured specifically to channel surplus value that's produced actually in production. And through these like trade schemes and like kind of offshoring contracts and like different ways of like equity stakes that major multinationals have in smaller firms in the global south, you know, surplus value gets distributed upwards. Yeah. And then this is all managed through financial instruments and through banks. You know, banks are like the investments that allow these value chains to like exist are they're invested via financial institutions and banks. And mm -hmm. then on top of that, the major industrial corporations have their own financial wings that are often just as large as any bank. Mm -hmm. And so finance capital has a huge stake uh, in terms of drawing from interest in this rate of profit, these corporate profits. And as we we're talking about with like the role of credit and the way that it kind of like mixes current surplus value sums magnitudes with projected ones, and then the relative risk that any given projection has can be kind of bet on in like the exact supply of money in the world does not necessarily correspond with like the productive capacity and like the, the actual magnitude of value that can be extracted from production. It's something that constantly fluctuates and has to kind of match up in the capital circuit in the move from, you know, production to commodity prime to money prime or whatever. And that, that specific like leg of the circuit obviously occurs at great scale, but relatively is shrinking, right? Most profit, that money prime, basically gets just diverted to various like financial investments. And so this is where we have to talk about circulation. And like when Dick was talking about like activity, you know, there's a whole world of so-called capitalist businesses that effectively just trade on the same supply of surplus value, you know, they're all mm. sipping out of the same trough. Yeah. And because of commodity fetishism and its extension into the whole like Trinity formula, where capitalists think that their investment is what produces capital and banks think that their interest bearing loans is what produces investments. You know, all these people think that when they expand their money, that that expansion is due to their activity and that has nothing necessarily to do with production, right? Mm -hmm. The fetish form of money makes it, it obscures the actual operations going on and obscures the relationships between workers and between countries. And so all of these metrics that we use to talk about the economy, whether it's GDP, whether it's the S&P 500, the, like the, the stock indexes, these are all just indexing the balance sheets of financial institutions and, and whatnot. And it's just measuring the volume of activity of, of how often and how frequently and how large the trading is, but they're often just trading nothing. And so when we talk about like liquidity, the way I view it is it's kind of like you have a certain finite amount of something and then you're just swapping it to a certain degree. And it's the same finite amount, but you're swapping it more and more rapidly. Yeah. And so liquidity is just giving you the capacity to swap it even more rapidly and even at a larger volume. And so yeah. when the, the Fed kind of comes in and so-called injects liquidity and basically creates new, new treasury securities for there to be new currency, that enables the banking system to kind of take that money and try to quickly put it into something. But 
because of like the fetish form of money, they don't make any distinction between putting into something that will actually produce new value versus something that will merely kind of snipe value produced elsewhere. Yeah. And that, that distinct, that's important that they don't make that distinction. It's not just that they're stupid. All these guys are stupid, but that's not the reason for this. The reason is you can't, it like, because of global, global overproduction, there's that's actually the relatively little you can invest in that would produce new value. So that's why we have all these asset bubbles is they're just kind yeah. of like pumping hot air into shit. You know, yeah. there's a reason we call it a bubble. So it's like, you know, if you're a big capital, you're a big capitalist, you've got loads of capital slushing around. Production is offering you a seven and a half percent return on investment with a lot of risk. And you can say, well, screw this. I'm going to go into some speculative thing. I'm going to get 30 percent return on it. And I'm going to get my friends in Congress to make sure when the shit goes down, the Fed will come in and buy me out at top price and yeah. let somebody else take the hit. That's the game now. Yeah, yeah, and that's been the game since like the Greenspan years at the Fed too. And like, yeah, Brenner is really good to read about this too. Like, his term for it is like asset price Keynesianism, and it, it's basically just like you know, like when they started lowering interest rates to allow for like more favorable lending, lending and borrowing conditions between like firms and for like stock market valuations. Basically, it just means like you got you know state support for what's going on you will have a safety net to a degree. I do want to touch on another thing here that's important to distinguish between like, you know, like pr production and circulation, like two like moments of like capitalist productions whole totality here uh, with, with like contradictory elements to how they sustain themselves and how they function. And the one I think that's key with circulation too, is that like, I mean, the, the tendency is to always push like circulation cost and like operations of those down to sort of like zero because like circulation is not the realm. Like it appears as the realm of, you know, like value creation in like the form of appearance that capitalism takes. But production is where you actually have like the source of surplus value at the point of like entering into like markets and circulation. You have an absolute ceiling of like, what surplus value is there and available and circulation functionally runs on costs that are effectively like deductions from like socially produced surplus value. So like while you have this sort of like swelling circulation sphere that's required to sort of like manage and redistribute these sort of like over capacity over accumulated productive capital in the world, it's also like eating away at that constantly and in a way that's like counter to it so like that those fictitious asset bubbles are a symptom of that as well and kind of compensating for those losses because it's the same way with like any labor performed in like circulatory spheres and that's like what you see with like phenomena like tertiarization in a lot of economies as they like transfer over into like more service sector led employment growth and like jobs that are more and more just sort of like skill rent or like gig kind of things like very precarious easy to let go and that's because you know their costs are deductions from some like a capitalist appropriable surplus value essentially but of course you know like they they don't see it that way like they don't job use, creators yeah job <laughs> creators job slaughterers but you know it's whatever it's cool like death of work is uh you know good for us in the long run <laughs> well to be clear working in retail is not not work <laughs> Shit's so exhausting. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> like, I think that's the other thing about that whole employment phenomena in these like sectors. It's just terrible. It's just like pushing you into contact with people in just like extremely alienated ways. Like you just don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And like not to be like workerist, because because I'm not, but you know, <laughs> there is something to be said for like the levers of production. Like it is it's just really hard to organize in the service sector. You know, there's like choke points and I, I still have a lot of like interest in transportation workers and the choke points can definitely impact the bottom line in like a really significant way and, and you know, attack capital. But like a lot of the time, the way like these circulatory networks have been set up and like the, the whole like logistics revolution, which has enabled like distributed production creates alternate pathways. And so it's like, it's really hard to actually like impact surplus value or capital accumulation as a service worker in like the first world you know a lot of whether it's like a retail place or like restaurant chains there's just like a lot of 
It doesn't you know, matter enough, basically. It doesn't There's loads of places you can buy new jeans or something. Yeah. And you just go to a different shop. It doesn't have systemic impact. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's like, you know, also a tendency of capital is like, you know, mitigating class struggle and issues with that. Like, that's why it's like we're constantly sort of like externalized from the point of production. Like, you see this in like Marx's writings on machinery. And I just was recently reading the famous little fragment on machines in the Grundrisse. And like, the machine never the technological innovations to the production process, like labor saving technologies never arrive preemptively. Like they arrive when there is a superfluity of labor and cost needs to be reduced. So like capital like posits the population that it already renders surplus initially. Right. I mean, we can and, see that with, sorry to interrupt, but just like the whole good. Silicon Valley innovation bullshit that everyone is getting high off the fumes of like that. I think looking back is more clearly a lagged response to massive buildup of superfluity in the American workforce. And And like, that's why the, all the jobs have been casualized because like those weren't jobs that could have kept on going. So they were replaced with like, not quite jobs. Yeah. Another interesting thing about those too, is like the Silicon Valley thing is like a lot of this is like even more like it's increasingly about intellectual property rents, you know, like they're, it's not about like production innovation so much. Like it's like logistics chains and it's like, like digitalization of like certain like labor processes and like market operations or technologies that allow for this stuff or like that keep circulation going. It, but you know, like they're mostly making a lot of their money on copyrights and it's all p- patent and copyright. Yeah. yeah. And I think an interesting international battle that's playing out over this is like the uh, patent applications for like the US and China. Like 2019 was the first year where China surpassed the US in in new patent applications for technology. So it's like, that's like also one of the, it's like over in the UK, you know, y'all have like, they're banning like working with Huawei or something as a security risk. Yeah, uh, right. yeah five- Chinese <laughs> listening to what we're saying, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 5G Corona, 5G uh, Corona. Americans listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, burn your uh, local 5G tower. <laughs> <Like>. <laughs> That's what apparently the Irish did, got loads of foreign direct investment in the 80s and 90s. And they were like, on a number of times, they were very suspicious because they thought they had these things down. And they figured out that GCHQ were listening to their phone calls and getting Whoa. their bi- knowing their bids. Ah, so had, so oh, had, shit. So they had to go offline when they were doing all this stuff, apparently. God, the Brits are such fucking winkers. On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.